it's crazy, but it's You're watching so Channel Z, the world's leading zombie apocalypse find, channel. It's something so Broadcasting cool. live from Studio Z. Makes me act the way I do. Good afternoon, intrepid survivors, and welcome to the Go Bag Challenge. I'm your host, Dr. Zarka. Today, we would like to welcome Danielle Sibolsky, author, historian, and creator and host of the Medieval Podcast. Thank you so much for being here, Danielle. It's great Hi, to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always good to see you. I have to tell our viewers that you were here for our inaugural 2018 ZAM. So it's so great to have you back, even though we are in this crazy virtual format. But hey, it's good to see you anyway. Yeah, it's the most fun conference there is. So I'm really happy to be back again. I'm so happy to hear that. So what are you here to tell us about today? What kind of monstrous knowledge do you have to share with us? Well, I'm a medievalist, so the knowledge that I'm bringing to you is the knowledge that I have from learning about the medieval world. So not just medicine, which is an important part of what I learned about the medieval world, but also how to defend against zombies, how to survive in a, in a world that doesn't have electricity anymore. And I think that's a really important thing to remember after the zombie apocalypse, we probably won't have any electricity. So we have to think of ways to survive and defend ourselves and uh, take care of ourselves after electricity is gone. So that is what I'm bringing to the table today. <laughs> I think that's so important because we have already all these lessons. And I think we see a lot of these, you know, apocalypse situations or horror movies or sci-fi scenarios, and people aren't paying attention to the libraries or the archives. And I just think that's such a wealth of knowledge, which you would know um, since you wrote a book, The Five Minute Medievalist Guide for Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse. Yeah. What are some of the biggest lessons you think we can learn from the past Past to help us survive the future? Well, I was thinking about this and there's three big lessons I think we can learn. And the first one you're getting at already, and that is we need to listen to our elders. So not just the people who have written stuff for us in the archives, but also the elders that are surviving today. Because if we think about the COVID epidemic pandemic, right now, we can look and learn some things from how people dealt with stuff before. The Spanish flu is a little bit outside a lot of um, the people who are still living now their experience, but we can learn a lot from our elders. And so the continent that I study is Europe. But if we're talking about survival in the zombie apocalypse in North America, where I'm living now, um, you really need to look at the wisdom of our indigenous elders, especially to think of like how we can deal with this environment and maybe not the ones, you know, in, in all the books that are European that we have in the libraries. That's one thing that I think is really important. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that we do rely a lot on both written and visual communication nowadays. But I mean, some of the greatest lessons and stories we have are from oral folklore. And you're right, if we're not valuing those lessons just as much as what's in the written word, we're going to be losing out on so much information. Yeah. And the time to learn about that is now before the apocalypse hits. <laughs> so right? true. So I so think that's true. important. The next thing I think we need to learn from history okay. is, <laughs> is that we need to document our struggles, right? So it doesn't seem maybe important when you're in the survival situation to write down what's happening to you. But as the months go on, you really do want to do that because a lot of what we know about, for example, the Black Death, we know from what people wrote during the Black Death, so not just the stuff they wrote down, but even their graffiti tells us stuff about the Black Death, how it spread, how people coped with it. So it's really important to, um, yeah, write it down, <laughs> write down the stuff that is happening to you in real time so that people can learn from it later. Even if you don't survive, heaven forbid, other people can learn about that later. So I think that's really important. Um, and then the last thing I would say mm -hmm. is that you can't afford in a post-apocalyptic world to waste people or resources. So people can always be helpful. There's always a job for someone to do. And you can always reuse and recycle things. So you can't afford to let anything go to waste. When we look at the Middle Ages, and again, if we're looking at indigenous histories as well, people are using all parts of the animals that they're eating, for example, for everything. And that's something that we can, we can learn from um, people who are living before our time, how much they used the stuff that they had mm -hmm. and reused it and reused it until it was worn out. That's not something that's part of our culture right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important thing to remember. 
No, I think that's so crucial. And I think you're right that some people, indigenous communities do still practice that belief. But do you think then it would be important if we're trying to preserve? I think a lot about as someone who can only knit like a scarf, I can pretty much make <laughs> one shape. I'd be pretty screwed when it comes to making clothing. So do you think having some kind of sewing kit or other kind of textile repairing would be helpful to have in your survival kit? Yeah, in your survival kit, I think when when you're asking me what should be in your go bag, I think it's really it's important to think of it in terms of the things that are not easy to reproduce or not easy to improvise. Those are the things that you want to have in there. And it's really stuff that people have put in their combat kit like since the Middle Ages, before the mm -hmm. Middle Ages, into World War II and stuff like that. And one of the things that people carry with them is a needle and thread because it's hard to improvise a needle um, and it's hard to improvise thread. So a needle and thread. I'm not really worried about textiles you know, for a few years after the zombie mm. apocalypse, because we can get those, we can still Scavenging. raid our towns. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. But eventually, yeah, you do need to learn how to sew. <laughs> so we actually do have a question here from Athena Atkipis. Should you have something to write with in your go bag? Yeah, actually in my go bag, if I had put together, I would have a Sharpie. And I think it's, we, you might have a pen or a pencil or something like that. Pencils mm -hmm. are great because they are, waterproof right you can use mm. them underwater which is great but i would want to have a sharpie also because you can leave messages for other humans and you can leave them on all sorts of surfaces because zombies can't read but people <laughs> can read <laughs> and you need to tell somebody where to find you so a sharpie would definitely be something to write with and also mm. help you document your struggles as you go through that brings up such a good question about language, too. I mean, that's one thing. If you're really trying to rebuild some kind of society, you'd want to have knowledge in different languages or at least have people in your survival group so you're not just writing that message in only English or only French or only Chinese or whatever your language is. I think that's interesting. Another point we have here. All right. From Alana, do you think we should stock up on solar panels since the electric grid may go down? Or is that even too much tech to rely on? If you're asking me as a medievalist, I would say don't don't bother with solar panels if you're thinking apocalypse. If you're thinking about right now, like let's save the world and get our solar panels, mm -hmm. but if we're talking about the post-apocalyptic mm -hmm. world, I'm not sure that a solar panel is going to be able mm -hmm. to be salvaged. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it could be useful if you have a solar battery, for example, but I would say you know, maybe that's a lower priority mm -hmm. because you have that to maybe help you use electronics until your electronics die. You have to plan for them eventually not working as well. But, you know, solar batteries can last for a while. So, you know, I would probably not put solar panels at the top of the list, but I think other people might. Okay. I think you're right. I think now they're more important, but let's say we're, you know, 20 years, 50 years into an apocalypse, no solar panels are left, or maybe you can't don't have them they've been destroyed as a medievalist what kinds of like things do you think are going to be most important should we w rely on fire do we need to focus on heat do we focus on wind technology what should we be doing to try to regain some kind of energy platform that's a really good question in the middle ages as in the times before and after people were harnessing wind and water so windmills and water mills are definitely something we can rebuild and use easily and they will help us to use things that are mechanical not necessarily electrical so medieval mills for example they're grinding grain and things like that that's mechanical and it works really well with a water mill or a windmill um, not necessarily electrical. And those are things that we can rebuild. I think that we have a sense of how to make them already. And so that would be something that you could rebuild and reuse later. And they might last longer than a solar panel only because it would be hard to repair a solar panel if it went down. It's easier to repair a windmill or a water mill. That's things. so true, especially when all these different production plants that we rely on so heavily now are down. Yeah, remaking a solar panel compartment, I think would be pretty difficult, but repairing a windmill would be a little bit easier, yeah. which I think this brings up another question about what kind of trade is going to be valuable um, after the apocalypse. Because I think that a lot of the things we take for granted now might not necessarily uh, be worthwhile, at least beginning of the apocalypse. But that being said, as some, a medievalist, I'm sure you know that sometimes the people with the greatest skills are not necessarily the ones most valued in society. So do you <laughs> think that some kind of apocalyptic situation would sort of change the dynamic with class divides or hierarchies? Or do you think we'd stay the same? I think that it would inev inevitably change how people mm -hmm. are valued in society because the skills that you need are going to be different. But hopefully everybody is valued for different skills. For example, you know, as a medievalist, maybe I'm not the first person invited to the dinner party, 
But after the apocalypse happens, people are going to want to know this information, right? So I think that are the skills that we have are going to have different values for sure. Um, and the trade that you're talking about, what what are people going to want? They're going to want to mm -hmm. trade things like metal that are hard to mm -hmm. make until we start to learn that skill again. Mm -hmm. So I do think it'll reorganize itself and hopefully reorganize it. I mean, if we have the chance to reorganize it, maybe reorganize yeah. it in a, in a great way that's hopefully more equal. Hopefully better. Yeah, that's such a great point. I always feel that I'm in people's zombie survival groups, not because <laughs> I'm a monster. I know a lot about zombies, but because I'm paranoid has both of those things. <laughs> so I might not have a lot of practical skills, although I'm working on it, but yeah, I'm with you. But this goes back to the idea of language and knowledge, right? Is how do we keep telling lessons, which is something as two historians, I think we could definitely do. Although we have a question here from the audience, Carlo asking, why do our stories always distinguish between humans and zombies by using language? Carlo, this is like out of my wheelhouse, man. But I think it's because we we think of zombies as not having intelligence the way we have intelligence. And the way we express ourselves and our intelligence tends to be through language. And if a zombie mm -hmm. does not have that intelligence, it's um, the need that it has to communicate is not going to be as sophisticated, right? It just needs to say things like, I need brains. And you don't really need <laughs> a lot of language for that. So I think that's why, but that's that's a tricky question. I think that's more a philosophical question yeah. than a historical question. I would have to agree with you because I think <laughs> that there's this idea of basing zombie versus human on language also talks a lot about disability in the modern world, right? Or even just communication barriers. It's that who's to say that one person's language doesn't make sense to them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I think of even twins, right? Sometimes twins will have their own sort of secret languages and it makes sense to them. Does that make them less human because we don't know what it is? Um, to answer the question, Carlo, though, I would say as someone who's seen many a zombie movie, it depends on the type of zombie. Um, some zombies, particularly the Romero strain of zombies in his universe actually do have the ability to communicate, which again, does bring up these different philosophical questions about so what if you did have a reanimated corpse that could also <laughs> talk and walk and act like a normal human in so many ways? You know, where's the barrier there? But I don't know if we can get too much into post-humanism and all that now. So <laughs> I'll bring up another question. Ooh, rather a comment here. All right, Neil Smith, you can come to my dinner party, Danielle, as long as you bring a case of mead. That's right. an interesting question. Do you know how to make mead? Do I know how to make it? No. <laughs> I know the components, but I've never made it. I'm I'm a person who has read about it and never made it. But mead is something that we should have during the apocalypse because we should always have honey during the apocalypse. Mm. And this is something that was mentioned before, I think, on one of your other go bag challenges. Mm -hmm. Somebody was talking about you need to have uh, honey because honey is good to eat, of course, but it's also really good for wounds. You can use it to clean wounds. You can use it to bind wounds. Um, people used it in the Middle Ages to uh, be that spoonful of sugar that helped the medicine go down as well. So honey is super important. And if you have honey, you can make mead. That's such an excellent point. I'm a huge proponent of honey. And I know that to get nerdy about it. Back in the day um, in ancient Egypt, it was such a valuable commodity it was actually in marriage contracts. But again, this it's, I love how all this is so full circle because this brings up issues, right? About how the bee population worldwide is declining. So tell me a little bit more about your opinions as medievalist. How do you think that we might be setting ourselves up for not the best situation post-apocalypse given what's going on in the world right now? I think that what we are doing uh, is we're forgetting those skills that we need, we will need if our electricity goes down, if our technology goes down. So a lot of the things that we are using technology for, we we might not have that technology for in the future. And one of the things that might be very small that we think about um, as, as leaning on technology a lot is we use it as our memory. So we use our phones and stuff to remember everything for us. And so in some ways, our memories are not as good as people's were in the Middle Ages. So how, how do you account for that? How do you get around that? In the Middle Ages, when people needed to remember something, they would rhyme it or they would sing it or they would just repeat it a bunch of times and maybe write it down. But right now we're depending on technology for things like that. Um, and maybe that's not the wisest choice. Also small things like farming and knitting, like you're talking about, these are skills that are starting to decline and um, we will need those skills in the case of a zombie apocalypse. So 
while not everybody is going to be interested in learning how to knit, it's great to know somebody who knows how to knit so that, you know, post-apocalypse, that's the person you can pick up on your way out of town. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> it is all about cooperation. Like, I'd want to meet up with you so we could share our mutual knowledge and find a blacksmith somewhere, find a farmer somewhere else. I think that's such a good point is that what it really comes down to is we are ultimately going to have to rely on each other um, mm -hmm. as humans, living humans, I guess I should say. Maybe not immediately, but in the long term to preserve society. Um, talking though about medicine, what are the primary medicines we can forge for that they used in the ages that we might be able to access today? Right. Okay. So the first thing I want to mention to you, Emily, I think you're living in Arizona right now. And so for you on the way out of town, you want to grab a handful of antibiotics, as many as possible, because <laughs> where you live is still a hot spot for the black death, the bacterium that causes oh, the black death. So right. get your antibiotics on the way out of town. As a medievalist, I would tell you there is nothing more important than antibiotics. <laughs> I don't want to have a time machine because I wouldn't have those. Um, the primary medicines you can forage for, you don't necessarily have to forage for honey, that's something you can grab. Alcohol um, as a way to sterilize things, as a way to, well, make people a little bit easier to work on if you need to in a medical situation. Um, willow bark is something that people used um, to kill pain in the Middle Ages, so that's something you can get fairly easily. Um, there's a lot of things that you can get just kind of around you and it really depends on where you are. But a lot of the things that you have in your pantry are still very useful are things like salt, honey, alcohol, things like that. So start, start there, Carlo, and then uh, look at the plants that you have around you. Um, willow is a good one. Especially. I have a follow-up question on salt, but before you mention antibiotics, I do actually keep all my expired antibiotics um, in my survival kit. I think I actually have someone who will join us who has a good share with us. Let's welcome our guest here, Hi. Jennifer Brinkor. Thank you so much okay. for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. So, what, what, so Danielle, before we get into Jessica's bag, let's talk a little bit about salt. What do you think we could use salt for um, in the apocalypse? Salt is really necessary for our diets, right? We need to have salt. So if we are running from zombies and sweating, we need to replenish that salt. But also it's really important to um, preserve food. And that's something we're not going to be able to do because we won't have fridges if we don't have electricity. So we have to put our food in the ground and we have to salt it or we have to smoke it. So you definitely want to have salt so that you can keep your food, especially your meat, lasting longer when you don't have refrigeration. Well, let's see what's in Jessica's go back. Do you have any salt? Oh, I've got a big ass bag of salt in there. So <laughs> right beside the Canadian flag is um, 10 pounds of Himalayan salt. Smart. It's smart to have salt in there and a big Canadian flag. I mean, yeah. Canadian flag. Tell yeah. me more about that Canadian flag. And you seem to have a couple different Canadian passports here as well. Yeah. So um, just to explain, I decided when I was pulling this together that for the first time since I've become a parent, I'm not going to pack everybody's suitcase in the house. I'll pack <laughs> the passports and everyone else can handle themselves. So that was the that was the first thing. So some of those are my children's passports. And then there's an American passport there and that belongs to my husband. And then I threw in some expired ones because I thought it made it look, I don't know, bigger. <laughs> I had more, but I had many passports that I could give away to other people and, and things like that. Well, that's um, the thing, right? If society really does fall down, I mean, you can't scan it through the computer system, right? To find yeah. out if it's expired or not. So I would just better safe than sorry is my general <laughs> motto. Just go with it, right? Um, so my plan is very short term. So in my envisioning of the apocalypse, that for unknown reasons, the United States is disproportionately affected by this zombie problem. And so I'm just going to go home. So <laughs> I'm going to bring my, my kids and my husband with me. And so that's the plan. So that's, I packed to like dash for the border with a couple of backup things in there, just in case that didn't work out. The salt is one of them. And I mainly packed it, not just for preservation of stuff, but um, as a weapon because oh. I had been told uh, that in, in Haitian zombie myth that salt is a curative. So that was the... Yeah, um, that stems back a lot of different cultures actually do believe that pure salt, like a salt ring can be protective in different ways. Although I haven't heard specifically that Haitian voodoo uses salt as a deterrent. I mean, you, salt yeah, seems to work for fairies, a bunch of other things. So if 
I like it. You can season your food, <laughs> make sure your meat's preserved, and potentially provide uh, protection from the supernatural. But Danielle, okay. what else are you meant seeing in here that might be particularly useful from your perspective? Well, I'm seeing scissors, and that's an important thing that you need. You need to have something that will cut things. So in my go bag, the first thing I have on it is a knife um, because you need a knife for things like, well, for carving food, for making tools, for making uh, weapons, for being a weapon. And so uh, scissors are great to have in there. You can use them as scissors or you can take them apart and use them as two blades, which I think is very, very smart of you. We have I, such I, a good comment right now. Sorry to interrupt, Jessica, from Athena. It's so hard to figure out how to put a go bag plan together when there are kids and animals involved. Mm -hmm. I know, Jessica, you mentioned kids, but Danielle or Jessica, do you have any insight into the best way we can be prepared for traveling with others, essentially? Traveling with others. <laughs> I think it's the same as I think it's the same as anything else, right? You have to take the tools that you can use to improvise outside. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as long as you have the tools you need to start improvising, you can do that as a group. But uh, Jessica, what, what would you say? So I, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think, I think maybe generally with children having something that can keep them occupied, even if it's one of those like cups with a ball on a string attached to like something that keeps them occupied while you're trying to say, make a break for it if you are in a vehicle. The other thing is that um, my kids have particular dietary tastes and so having a few days of that stuff might be like those items might be helpful until you can sort of like assess and get kids used to the idea that things are unusual now yeah. absolutely i think that's um, one so thing that, a lot of people i would suggest yeah, I think that's one thing a lot of people forget about um, for preparing for any kind of emergency situation is that the first couple of days, if not weeks or I mean years are going to be absolutely chaotic. So I like to say uh, my personal approach to any kind of survival kit is the same thing that they tell you when you get on an airplane, right? You need to apply your own mask before securing that um, of kids or other people who can't. So for me, I think it's about making sure that you have what you need to survive. And then because you can do that, you can help other people do the same. But again, comfort <laughs> items are so important. I know I keep a bag of cards um, in my survival kit, not just for entertainment, uh, but if you needed to trade them, because that's the other thing, right, about some of these items in our bags. And someone even mentioned, uh, Christopher here is a comment that black market materials like expired counterfeit passports might be great for use to trade. Go. Which I think, yeah. Danielle, this brings us back to you too. What kind of items do you think would be particularly valuable that maybe the past can teach us? Us as being particularly significant. Um, again, these are things that that require skills that are we don't have. We don't generally have, and so I would say, yeah, things that are made of metal. If you have something that's made of metal, mm -hmm. that's going to be really, really useful because not many people know how to be blacksmiths right now. Yeah. Like a lot of us can figure out how to carve something out of wood, but to forge something out of steel or iron, like that is a really difficult skill. Mm -hmm. So like if you can collect a whole bunch of like pots and pans in your van, like that's going to be really useful later. <laughs> I never thought of that. And that brings up a good point, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you should have like different levels of go bags or survival kits. So maybe you have the one to get you to your car that has the sleeping bags for warmth or that has the pots and pans. Mm -hmm. But let's see what else you have here, Jessica. So you do have the scissors, so you're off to a good start there. I see some beans, although someone did mention in one of our comments, do you think that maybe having dried beans would be a little more effective? Um, from oh. my perspective, I would say yes. I mean, canned goods are good for longevity, but you would ultimately the cost uh, ratio of the energy expending for your go bag might not be the safest route. Well, the, the tricky thing is about these canned beans is you need to have a can opener. So make yes. sure you have a Swiss army knife or a can opener yes. and bring those right. with you. Yeah. Um, otherwise dry stuff, you know, you can just open the bag. <laughs> well, you need pots also to cook them in, right? So like when you're bringing dry, a bag of dry beans, you're necessarily also bringing, I mean, hopefully a pot among other things, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, I think from, you know, again, had I... <laughs> uh oh, and, we switched oh, out no. She is completely off the street. She must have somehow been impacted by the zombie apocalypse. I was looking myself. Um, I do have a can opener in my bag. I have one of my multi multi-purpose tool. And then I do also have another one. Um, but yes, can openers, such a good point. So going back to what someone was saying previously, that's 
probably one of the benefits, right, about dried beans, if you kept them in some kind of Ziploc or container that you don't have to worry about the can opener. But if you're going to be foraging, I would highly recommend that you have a can opener in general. Um, one other thing too, I'll pull back up her bag here. I don't see any really, I mean, we have some bandages, which are helpful, but I know I think I've said this before to you, Danielle, you've got to have that duct tape. We have to think about just the same way with metals, right? We have to think about the different kinds of things that aren't going to be as accessible. If it's yeah. solar panels, if it's metal, if it's duct tape. I mean, I think yeah. duct tape is going to be a long way off if we could ever actually make that again. So if you had to prioritize things to have, so you said metal for sure, what else? Yeah. So like my top couple of things would be a knife would be um, would be duct tape, would be antibiotics. Those would be like the top things. Okay. Um, I noticed that in Jessica's kit, she has a lot more things that, than I have. And I think mm -hmm. that's because like, I think she's picturing making an escape on a vehicle. And as a mm -hmm. medievalist, I think I'm picturing making an escape without a vehicle, <laughs> maybe a, a horse or something. I don't know. Okay. Um, and so that's different. She has more things than, than mm -hmm. I have, but a knife, um, uh, duct tape and antibiotics, I think are the most important things that you can pretty much make anything with those things. And then the antibiotics, mm -hmm. well, that's just coming from the fact that I know how, yeah. how bad diseases can be, especially in Arizona, you want to have that. Uh, kind of stuff. You're making me so nervous, but <laughs> I have a lot of stored antibiotics. So that brings a question about environment. So yeah. do you think that people need to be more aware about certain kinds of diseases in the area immediately surrounding them? And how can they gain that kind of knowledge? For sure. Um, you do need to be aware of the stuff that is around you, how you get that kind of knowledge. I think use the internet, <laughs> use the internet before the zombie apocalypse. Right, happens, while you still right? can. Yeah. While you still can, because um, you have right now, the governments are collecting that information. You might not have mm -hmm. that later. I think that the information that you need to bring with you is maybe not the diseases that you have right now, but a book of how to use the local plants that you have now, mm -hmm. because, you know, humans will have a whole bunch of really um, similar symptoms for many different things. And so if you can have things that take care of those symptoms, well, that's better than nothing. So I would say a book of, of how to use plants to your advantage is more useful perhaps than knowing like the statistics of the diseases that are around you. Absolutely. I know I carry a book in my bag that some people have told me is, oh, it's too much, but it's called How to Eat During the Zombie Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So it gives you the basics about how to, you know, kill, trap, skin animals, different yep. foods to forage for. And I'm with you. I think that while we can, you know, get those books, get on the internet, learn those things that maybe we need to be collecting information now. And I know that not just here in Arizona, but across the globe, there are so many different communities and places you can go to, to learn foraging techniques, to learn emergency first aid techniques, to learn Smith work. Um, Alana did ask the question, what about a star map or any kind of map? Okay. A star map would be useful for you if you want to travel. So it depends on where you want to travel. And if it's, you're traveling in one of the cardinal directions, you need to know where the North star is and you can figure yourself out from there. Mm -hmm. So a star map will do you do some good and it'll teach you things like how to tell time, like what month it is or things like that. But you can use other cues for that as well. So I wouldn't pack a star map necessarily okay. because um, I would only need it for direction. And I think mm -hmm. I, I have an idea of where I would be spending the apocalypse. So I don't necessarily need that. Another map might be useful if you think that you need to find a close town or if mm -hmm. you're if you're somewhere where, you know, you, the apocalypse hits and you're not familiar with it. You know, a map would be very helpful for you mm -hmm. to find close towns in order to find stuff that you need there or to avoid zombies that might be there. Yes. <laughs> so. Or other people looking for that same stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would be veering off of the highways and main roads personally because they're going to yeah. be more heavily populated. So exactly. if you didn't have a star map, Map and you didn't have a normal map, would there be any other kind of directional device that you would want to have, like a compass or something? Um, again, it depends on if you have to get anywhere. And mm -hmm. I mean, you might just be better off trying to figure out where you need to set up your settlement. And Dr. Joe and I are going to talk about that tomorrow, Dr. Z and I. Perfect. Uh, Everyone will have to tune in for that. That's on just Saturday. as important. It's, so I think what we can sort of summarize what we talked about in this episode, right, is that it's about preparing now. Yeah. And there is a difference, someone mentioned a difference between preparedness and hoarding. I think from my perspective, and I'd be curious to know what you say too, it's about, like you said, prioritizing. So get a pan, get, you know, some metal, get antibiotics mm -hmm. and get a knife, right? And then you 
can hype or can opener, you can kind of get your way around everything else. So I think, and that's also the medieval approach, right? Sometimes yeah. less is more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, medieval people sometimes had to flee from combat and that's something we have to do as mm -hmm. well. So you want to have a lean kit as lean as possible so that you can run. <laughs> that's yes. the most, most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I think that's all the time we have for today. But thank you so much, Danielle. And thank you, Jessica, who I'm sure had very important things to attend to. Uh, and thank you, viewers, for joining us. If you are registered for ZAM, head over to the interactive workshops from 3.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And as always, stay aware, stay prepared, and we will see you next time here on the Go Bag Challenge. Crazy, but it seems so logical. I can't deny that there is something supernatural with you.